Good evening, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome to De Rode Hoed tonight. It's good to see you all, and thanks for being here on this lecture, for this lecture on the crisis in Syria. And a particularly warm welcome to our distinguished speakers tonight, Koos van Dam, Hadi Abagra, and Ibrahim Hamidi. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. I am Karin Wester of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Before we get started, first, a few household remarks. Uh, first, please turn off the ringtones of your mobile phones if you haven't yet done so. And secondly, a couple of remarks on the nature of these lectures. As regular attendees of the series know, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs organizes these Henriette van Linde lectures in order to facilitate a well-informed debate on current affairs in the Middle East. However, the views expressed and the perspectives conveyed during these lectures do not necessarily represent the views of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Now Syria. Looking at the current Middle East, there might be no sadder yet more crucial topic than the situation in Syria. Sometimes it's good to remind ourselves that the current crisis started six and a half years ago, in March 2011, with a peaceful uprising of common people who had broken their shackles of fear and took to the streets with modest demands for more freedom and social reforms. Encouraged by previous uprisings in Tunisia, Egypt, and Libya, they assumed their demands might be given a chance by a regime that was known to be amongst the most repressive in the Middle East. It was not to be. The uprising was brutally oppressed. The situation turned into a violent conflict and morphed into a regional conflict and ultimately into an international conflict in which many different actors, each with their own interests, were involved. Meanwhile, the country has been destroyed. More than 400,000 documented victims have been killed and half of the Syrian population has been displaced. Many of these people are living now in neighboring countries in appalling conditions. One wonders, how could this possibly happen? In a time of human rights treaties, humanitarian law, and a collective commitment to the enforcement of human rights. I am sure our three speakers tonight will address that question. But they will also look ahead. And present their views on the prospects to resolve this brutal conflict. This is a crucial time for Syria. With ISIS mostly defeated, at least militarily, Bashar al-Assad, having regained control of substantial parts of Syrian territory and an active, though not necessarily united, opposition holding other parts of the country, the question is, what will the future of Syria look like? Our intention tonight is not only to focus on the short-term military or political gains or losses, but also to look beyond those into the future of the country and the prospects of the Syrian population. Hence the title, Syria, who will win the future? Let me now introduce the first speaker to you. Nicolas van Dam is a former diplomat and a scholar and author on the Middle East. He is a specialist on Syria who served as Dutch special envoy 
for Syria in 2015 and 2016. Previously, he was the Dutch ambassador to Iraq, Egypt, Turkey, Germany, and Indonesia. He's also the author of the recently published book, Destroying a Nation, The Civil War in Syria. In the 1980s, he published The Struggle for Power in Syria, Politics and Society under Assad and the Ba'ath Party. The author, Karsten Wieland, wrote about Van Damme. He is a rare species, an academic analyst, an excellent diplomat who has accompanied and shaped recent Syrian history in theory and practice. He's also brutally honest, including with Western policy failures. Well, since this is an open platform for debate, we are always willing to scrutinize our own policies, and I'm sure we will not be disappointed tonight. Nicolas Van Damme, you now have the floor. Please give Mr. Van Damme a warm welcome. Thank you very much, Helen. Ladies and gentlemen, we all know that the situation in Syria has become a disaster. And one can ask oneself whether this disaster could have been foreseen and prevented. I personally am convinced that the main developments in Syria could have been foreseen, certainly as far as the behavior and misbehavior of the Syrian regime were concerned. For many observers, however, all the cruelties at first went beyond their imagination, even though they could have been predicted and were predicted by some people having some deeper knowledge of the Syrian regime. There were some essential elements, however, that could not have been clearly foreseen, and one of these was the so-called Arab Spring that brought many Syrians in a kind of euphoric uh, mood after political leaders in Tunisia, Egypt, and Libya resigned or were toppled with the help of Western and Arab countries that proclaimed that they wanted to su support or protect the Arab populations against their dictators, dictators or authoritarian rulers. The peaceful Syrian demonstrators imagined at the time that they would be fully supported by the Western and Arab countries that had proclaimed that they wanted to help them. In the end, however, it turned out that this help was not only insufficient to achieve regime change, but also it contributed to a prolongation of the war with all its destruction and death. Another element that was not foreseeable at the beginning of the revolution was that the Syrian military opposition groups were going to receive substantial military aid from foreign countries like the United States, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and others, enough to start a combination of a civil war and a war by proxy, but not enough to bring about the regime change they wanted. In fact, the war was initiated in reaction to the atrocities of the regime without, however, sufficient means and planning that this war against the regime could also really be won. Before engaging in the war, the interfering countries should have sufficiently studied the military situation in order to be sure that their Syrian allies had a realistic chance of winning it, but apparently they did not. The half-hearted military interventions of various countries, various foreign countries in Syria, have in fact contributed to disaster. Most of the interfering countries, like Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Turkey, the United States, Iran, Russia, and others, all had their own strategic interests and motives. <coughs> These were not necessarily coinciding with the interests of the Syrian people. Certainly not if one looks at the disastrous results. Therefore, the question seems justified whether or not the so-called friends of Syria in the end really turned out to be the friends of the Syrian people. Those who supported the opposition groups generally claimed that they wanted a political solution, but this solution in reality was intended to be regime change 
if not peacefully, which was not going to happen anyhow, than with military force. But did, this didn't work either, because the option of direct military intervention was written off in 2013. Russia and Iran intervened militarily because they wanted to safeguard the Syrian regime as an important strategic regional ally. For Saudi Arabia and Qatar, it was important to remove Syria from the Iranian power orbit. And I have no illusions, I have few illusions, that it was the priority of Saudi Arabia and Qatar to military impose a political system on Syria that they did not have themselves, notably a secular pluralistic democracy. The United States, who never had been friends with the Syrian Ba'athist regimes, wanted the same as Saudi Arabia and Qatar, as far as Iran was concerned, but they also welcomed a weakening of Syria to the advantage of Israel. And Turkey wanted a like-minded Islamic regime in Damascus. None of these countries has achieved what they wanted, and neither did the Syrian opposition. Many politicians may have sincerely wanted to help the Syrian population against its oppressive regime, but for the bigger countries, I think strategic interests were at least as important as humanitarian considerations. It should have been clear from the very beginning in 2011 that the regime of Bashar al-Assad was not going to voluntarily give up its power position and resign. Thinking that al-Assad would step down or aside <laughs> as demanded by many Western and Arab political leaders, as well as by the Syrian opposition, may have been well intended and justified from their points of view, but it obviously was not going to happen. Which Syrian dictator has ever given up his position voluntarily to be imprisoned or executed afterwards? None, of course. The Syrian war was bound to happen because Syria had been dominated for more than 40 years under the presidents Hafez al-Assad and Bashar al-Assad, who managed to stay in power with the support of an all-powerful military faction with a highly reliable and effective security apparatus, also effective in the sense of severe repression. And this resulted in a period of internal political stability and continuity, longer than ever before in, since Syrian independence. This continui continuity, however, was also linked to the absence of any substantial political reform or change in the composition of the ruling military elite, which implied the serious future possibility of strong discontinuity and disruption of the regime, once its long-serving political and military leaders would be endangered or would disappear. This so-called stability of the Assad regime came to an abrupt end with the Syrian revolution in 2011. More than 20 years ago, I predicted in my book, The Struggle for Power, and it was not, not that difficult to predict, that any scenario leading to the overthrow of the Alawi-dominated power elite would inevitably be extremely violent. After all, the regime had never tolerated any real opposition, let alone alternative military factions that might threaten its position. Serious opponents were generally put in prison, severely tortured or killed. It was all about maintaining regime power and interests with the most repressive means. Whereas the common sectarian, regional and family or tribal backgrounds of the Ba'athist rulers had been key to the durability and strength of the regime, the predominantly Alawi sectarian background of many of them was also one of its main weaknesses. This is because the Alawi factor, or, or the so-called Alawi guardian knot, is hindering a peaceful transformation from Syrian dictatorship towards a more widely representative regime. During, the rule of, uh, during its rule, 
The Syrian Ba'ath regime became the antithesis of its own ideals. The Ba'athists had wanted to do away with primordial loyalties like sectarianism, regionalism, and tribalism, which, according to their ideology, were considered to be despicable residues or illnesses of traditional society. But in practice, the ruling Ba'athists ex achieved exactly the opposite what they wanted because their sectarian tinted behavior strengthened in particular the factors they claimed to abhor. Their ideals in the sphere of socialism and social equality could not be fulfilled either because of the fact that the regime was infested with corruption, clientelism, and favoritism. And their ideal of Arab unity could not be realized because there was not any Arab leader who was prepared to share his powers with others. And last but not least, instead of being a Ba'ath party rule, the Syrian regime has become a kind of dynastic rule of the al-Assad family. <clears throat> Nevertheless, and irrespective of the basic characteristics of the regime, which should have been well known, Many Western and Arab politicians wanted President Bashar al-Assad and his regime to voluntarily step down. Certainly, after enough naming and shaming and moral pressure had been exercised by the numerous countries condemning him for all his atrocities the regime had committed when violently, violently suppressing any opposition, including the large-scale demonstrations that took place all over Syria many, if not most of them, being peaceful. But Bashar al-Assad stayed and refused to resign, as could have been predicted as well, if only because dictators do not generally follow the rules of democratic accountability. The Syrian opposition, just like many foreign countries, however, kept insisting that al-Assad should disappear as president and that he could not play any role in the transition, so-called transitional period, leading to a new regime, let alone in the future of Syria, and that he should be court-martialed, for instance, before the International Criminal Court in The Hague. But Bashar al-Assad was in power in Syria, and therefore these demands rather constituted a guarantee that serious negotiations with the regime were not going to take place. The regime, the Syrian regime, obviously was not prepared to negotiate its own departure and death sentence and never has been. The regime and the opposition have completely different views of what a compromise should look like. And without any form of serious dialogue, a pol political compromise is impossible. This does not necessarily mean, however, that if such a dialogue would start after all, that it would be also that it would also yield results, substantial results, if only because the regime considers the Syrian war a struggle for its own survival or a struggle for life and death. Only by toppling the regime with military force, it might have been possible to effectuate regime change. But not any country has been able or willing to do so. Moreover, regime change by military force would not necessarily have meant that the situation would improve, taking the experiences in Iraq, Libya, Yemen, and Afghanistan into consideration. After more than six and a half years, real dialogue is still being rejected by both the regime and the opposition, and the ever-increasing number of dead, the endless destruction, and the millions of refugees have only strengthened the rejectionist attitude towards one another. Yes, both sides do want dialogue, but only if the other party does more or less exactly what is demanded by the opposing party. Or, for instance, the United Nations Security Council Resolution 2254, the contents of which are being rejected by the regime to carry them out. It is remarkable that the Syrian regime has not even made any serious effort to come to a compromise with the opposition that operates from within the country. And opposition members who have been active abroad 
and want to return into the so-called lap of President al-Assad have been refused entry into the country. The opposition and bigger part of the so-called international community have claimed time, again, time and again that they want a just solution and therefore want the regime and its members to be made accountable for any crimes or war crimes committed. Taking this a point of departure, they actually want to be sure want to be sure beforehand that the negotiations will lead to the regime being court-martialed. In other words, they want to negotiate with the regime on, con on condition that President al-Assad cannot play any role in Syria's future, and preferably not either in the political transition that is supposed to lead to that future. For the Syrian regime, on the other hand, political transition is a, perceived as a kind of dirty word because it implies a kind of regime change through political transition in which the regime has to share political power with its adversaries with the run and the run the risk of being toppled. So if justice is to be done, it can only be done after a political solution uh, has been reached, but not before. One can safely say that if President Bashar al-Assad wins the war militarily, and it looks that way, this does not mean that he has also achieved a victory in the political sense. Because in fact, all Syrians are the great losers in this terrible war. The gigantic task of bringing Syria back to normal life in every sense remains one of the weakest spots of the regime. Once this weak spot comes more out into the open, it should not be excluded that opposition against the regime will also grow from within. Various Western politicians imagine that they can lure the Assad regime into political concessions and reform in exchange for funding parts of the reconstruction of Syria. This is, in my view, unrealistic because it is founded on the same false presumptions that existed during, existed during the last six years, that al-Assad will voluntarily make political concessions, in this case in exchange, exchange for foreign funds. Withholding construction funds may hit al-Assad in one of his weakest spots, the economy, but it will also hurt the Syrian population under his control, and that is something most Western countries do not want. Undoubtedly, there are other countries, like China, for instance, that want to jump into the reconstruction of Syria and participating in the reconstruction of the Syria, of the parts of Syria that are under control of the regime without contacts with the al-Assad regime is impossible. As a result of the war, there are many millions of traumatized and dissatisfied Syrians. Countless Syrians have lost family members, which has caused wounds that are not going to, which are going to stay on both sides. Corruption, embezzlement, and local suppression, suppression have increased enormously as a result of the war economy. People who were supposed to be loyal to the regime were not always loyal when it came to their personal and economic interests. To force these people who have profited from the war economy back into line and to put the ghost of intensive social conflicts back into the bottle is extremely difficult, if not impossible, without yet another settlement of accounts with those who are considered to be responsible for it. If Syria were a, rich, a very rich country, it, it would perhaps, perhaps be somewhat less difficult but the fact that the social fabric of society and economic life are in ruins makes it all the more difficult to restore so-called normal life. <clears throat> Personally, I have for practical and in my opinion also realistic reasons been calling for dialogue with the al-Assad regime from the very beginning of the Syrian revolution because I saw this as a key element on the way to a solution. Most of the time, However, this position was rejected because al-Assad was supposed to leave. But he did not, of course. With several hundred deadly victims, 
six and a half years ago, dialogue would have been less difficult than it is now, with the death toll going in the direction of half a million people. Under the present circumstances, it should be expected that the regime will continue the war just as long as it has all Syrian territories under its control again. Whether or not this, this succeeds also depends on the willingness of the foreign supporters of the military opposition to continue their aid. And whether, for instance, the United States would consider it worthwhile, for instance, uh, to um, risk a military confrontation with Russia over Syria. The territories on, under the control of the opposition are among the few remaining bargaining chips if foreign support is continued. It should not be excluded, however, that the, the foreign willingness to support the military opposition against the regime is decreasing, particularly after Daesh, the Islamic State, has been defeated. If you would ask me who will win the future of Syria, my answer is that in the near future, it will be the regime, because it's military the st strongest. This does not mean, however, that the regime is bound to win the future of Syria in the longer term. There is always the possibility of a change of forces from within, and as long as there is no political solution, the possibility of a settling of accounts between enemies, enemies remains. Whatever the case, serious efforts should be continued to help achieve a political solution, even if one is not fully convinced that the outcome will be a success. That is why I ended my new Syria book called Destroying a Nation with the words, miracles only happen when one keeps believing in them. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, um, Koos van Dam, for a very realistic and inevitably not very uplifting analysis, which nevertheless ended on a positive note. Thank you very much. And we will now turn to um, the next speaker, who is a representative of the uh, Syrian opposition, Hadi al Bahra. Hadi al Bahra is a member of the Syrian opposition coalition. He was the president of the National Coalition for Syrian Revolutionary and Opposition Forces from July 2014 to January 2015. Mr. Abakhra was also the Syrian Opposition Coalition's chief negotiator in Geneva II and the secretary of the coalition's political committee. Mr. Abakhra was born in the Syrian capital, Damascus, and is an industrial engineer by training who has used his extensive experience in information technology and communication management to serve the Syrian revolution from its start by co-founding groups that could bolster and coordinate communications between activists inside Syria and media outlets. He has also, over the last years, actively supported the opposition's relief works. Please give Mr. al -Bahra a warm welcome. Well, thank you for attending this event. And really, I'm honored to be among you. I will not bore you with more history about the conflict in Syria. As His Excellency, he stated all the history of the conflict, and he stated it very well, which I thank you for. I want you to think as Syrians, to see why the revolution has started in Syria. So I would like to share some personal stories with you. Long before the revolution happened in 2004, I visited London, I visited the Museum of History. So I saw an exhibit about dinosaurs. And I felt why the children of Syria never had such an exhibit. 
why don't we do it in Syria? So I went, I researched, I worked at it, I manufactured the dinosaurs in Belarusia, and I did the exhibition, the first edutainment exhibit in Syria in 2004. So I needed a guide tours for the exhibit. So I put an ad, I interviewed a few university students to act and to be trained as tour guides. In the interview, I had one question to ask them all. After graduation, what do you want to do? Amazingly, all of them, they had only one answer. That answer was, I graduate, I find a relative or a friend who knows somebody in the government, and he gets me a job in the government. None of them told me I had a dream. I had a project which I want to do myself. I, want, I have an idea for a company to run it. Or I dream to become the president of Syria or a senator in the Congress, in the Parliament of Syria. At that, mo at that moment, I realized that the regime has stolen the most valuable asset a human being can have. That value is the ability to dream. If our young generation cannot dream, they cannot create. They cannot hope. And we end as a nation. At that moment, I knew that we have to pay the price. We have to sacrifice and we have to revolt against this dictatorship. And from the first moment, I didn't hesitate to stand up by the young generation who revolted against the regime. They started peacefully. He gave us a clear history readout of the revolt, how it started. Second story I would like to share with you is some intimidating questions we are being asked as Syrians. Some questions who are against even scientific standing. Very commonly, we've been asked by diplomats and by politician expert about the alternatives. What happened if Bashar al-Assad falls and leaves? Their common assessment that the state institutions would fall and the state will collapse. This is contradicting question, intimidating question. Because the answer for it in two parts. The first part, what type of institutions or are they institutions if they would collapse if one guy would leave? These are not institutions if they, one guy leaves and they collapse. But our common answer our state institutions, and when I talk about state institutions, I'm talking about real institutions which provide uh, services to the Syrian people. Agriculture ministry, education ministry, health ministry, all these true public servants, our silent soldiers, which still until today, they report to their work under extreme condition. They go on daily basis to work in these institutions for making 10 or $20 a month. These soldiers, are the one who carry these institutions. These institutions are owned by the Syrian people, not by the Assad regime. These institutions have been in our life since the Ottoman Empire 400 years ago, and they will stand any condition and they will never fall. The only institutions would fall are two institutions. One, the security institutions. And if the international community asking for these institutions to continue, these institutions are professional and spying on Syrian people. These institutions are responsible for more than a million deaths in our life, for torturing civilians in jail. Are you or your government standing for these institutions to continue? 
Sorry, we don't have alternatives for these institutions, but if you want us to live under these institutions, we will not live. We will pay the price until we are free from these institutions. The other institution that may or would collapse is an institution which we were very proud of, which is the Syrian army. This institution started after we, Syria, being liberated from the French occupation of Syria. This institution where every Syrian was proudly to serve in, but this institution was hijacked by Ba'ath Party in the 60s. And after the 60s, each president came and made sure how this institution will stay divided in order not to do any coup against the regime itself. So it was turned from a national institution, which we were very proud of, into a machine to serve the ruler. What we are seeking in our uprising is a dream which you lived, rights which you enjoy on daily life, and I don't think so that you think that we should not have these rights. What we are caring of, caring to regain our human and constitutional rights. These rights were stolen by a brutal tyrant dictatorship in Syria. We want to live normal life like any one of you. We want our children to have dreams equal to the dreams of your children. We want to be active, productive people who can create and be part of the civil world and of the current civilization. Syrians are your history. Syria will host for the oldest continuously uh, city living uh, history in the world, Damascus and Aleppo, the first alphabet in Syria. These are not owned by Syrian. This is your civilization as a human being. This is your history, which you should care about. Who would own the future of Syria? Future of Syria will be owned by the people who were ready, really, to sacrifice half of a million lives. The people who half of the country forced to migrate outside Syria. These people, they sacrificed, they paid the price, and I'm talking about all Syrians on all sides. Even the people fighting with Assad, they were misled to fight against their own fellow citizens. These also, they paid the price. They lost their children also. We are keen to unite Syria. Assad never won, who won the Iranian in Syria. Assad continued in power because of the interference of Iran, because of the presence of sectarian militia who came from Afghanistan, from Pakistan, from Iran, from Lebanon, from Iraq, to stand by Assad. They are the one winning on the ground. Assad institutions, the fear institution, the military which he stands for, already collapsed. Already he is in power because of foreign interference in Syria. So this story finished. What we are seeking now is really to liberate our country from foreign presence. We are keen to return our sovereignty and the future of our kids. Thank you all for coming. Thank you very much, Mr. Hadi, for your um, engaging and, and, and impressive um, presentation. It's an honor for us to have you here, let me say that. <laughs> and I know um, you're working tirelessly for this cause, and um, we're very glad that you were able to make the time to visit us here in Amsterdam. So thank you for your participation tonight. We will now move to our third speaker, who is um, Ibrahim Hamidi. 
Ibrahim Hamidi is a Syrian journalist and senior diplomatic editor, Syrian affairs at Ashark al Assad newspaper, based in London. He also contributes regularly to several other international media outlets and think tanks. Previously, he served as bureau chief of the Arab daily newspaper Al Hayat in Damascus, as head of the Lebanese Broadcasting Corporation office in Damascus, and as a senior writer for Forward, Forward magazine also in Damascus. His work focuses on strategic issues in the Middle East and on Syria's internal and regional politics in particular. Ibrahim Amidi is also a research fellow and co-founder of the Syrian Studies Center at the, Ox the University of St. Andrews in Scotland and a co-founder of the Arab Investigative Journalism Program. Mr. Hamidi uh, will remain seated for uh, medical reasons while he is speaking, but uh, please give him a warm welcome. Um, first of all, thank you so much, Karin. Thank you, Yab. Thank you. Big thank you to all the foreign office here for inviting me here. Thank you for the all people that whom attending this uh, event. Second, um, excuse me if my English is not very good, so I'll try my best. I'm coming from London, but you know, I was not born in London, so I'll try my best with my English. So if, if I do any mistake, please blame my English, not my thoughts. Um, Three, uh, uh, of course, big thank you to Karen all, all, all about what she said about me, but in addition to what she said, I was in jail. I was arrested in Damascus when I was working with Al-Hayat as bureau chief in Damascus. But at the same time, I always wanted to be professional. It's very hard after what Hadi said, my dear friend Hadi said, as a great Syrian, to be Syrian and to be professional and objective, and this is what I'm trying to do. Um, yes, as Karin said and everybody said, the whole Syrian uprising, the whole Syrian crisis has started as peaceful demonstrations. It started like this. Peaceful demonstrations. This is the biggest demonstration, middle, uh, summer 2011, that, that is Hama. But over time, because of the brutal, brutal response from the regime and militarization of the uprising, Islamization of the uprising, it became over time a regional proxy war and then international proxy war. And then it became, Syria became like this. It's not a joke. It is very serious. This is 2015, 2014, 2015. We have international coalition with 70 countries bombing Syria. We have the Russians bombing Syrians. We have the Israelis bombing Syrians. And you have the Turks bombing Syrians. We have the Iraqi war jets bombing Syria. And we have the Jordanians. In addition to that, we had on the ground around 100,000 fighters in the opposition side, Islamists and moderates. And we had around 60,000 Shiite militias fighting with the regime. And we had around 60,000 Kurds fighting in north and northwest of Syria. And then the, Russian inter the Russians intervened two years ago, September 2015, and by then it became international proxy war, and the way they saw it, they, they, they forgot about the whole Syrian aspiration, and they started to think of the Syrian crisis as a stage to come back to the Middle East and to make deal with the regional powers. So they made, then they decided to freeze the conflict, and they made, just one year ago, deal to de-escalate the conflict and they spoke with the Jordanians, the Israelis, the Americans to have de-escalation zone in the south, not with the Syrians. 
they spoke with the Egyptians and the Saudis to do the escalation zone in the suburb of Damascus and Hamas. And they spoke with the Turks recently to have the escalation zone in north, in Idlib, my, 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 my area. And all these four de-escalation zones, the Syrians were not there, and they spoke with the Americans for de-confliction agreement over the eastern part of Syria to have the eastern part of Euphrates for the Americans and the western part of the Euphrates for the Russians and its allies. So over time, the Syrians who started this great uprising became proxy to the international players. They started to fight, fight that it's not their fight. They started to, to fight a war. It's not the Syrian war anymore. The Jordanians, they froze the conflict just to protect their, their, to protect their, their interest. The Turks froze the conflict to protect their interest and they wanted the Syrian opposition to fight the Kurds, not to fight the regime anymore. And actually, maybe this is, will not be very popular to say it here, the Kurds started to fight in Raqqa and other areas, the Western fight, not the Syrian fight. So that's over time. Once again, the Syrians started to fight a war that is not war. Now, about the future. I think now, having this workshop, now it is very timely, it's very, uh, the best time that we can discuss the scenarios of the future because of three reasons. One, because now we are marketing the second anniversary of the Russian intervention. Second, because now the emperor is naked. Raqqa being liberated, their Zor being liberated, and we know the Russians and the Americans, at least they said publicly that we are fighting in Syria because we are fighting ISIS. Now ISIS is over. The third, as I think Karin said, that the regime is advancing and recapturing, retaking most of the country. So what is next now? Where are we heading? I think we are at cross point, there are two scenarios. One is the worst case scenario, which is, I stole this phrase from David Frumkin, who wrote Hundred year ago, I mean, who wrote about hundred years ago, peace to end all peace, which is that it's very clear that is Putin is rushing to make a deal to de-escalate the conflict, to have sort of quick fix before the pres presidential elections in Russia March next year. So he wants to hold sort of any kind of deal like Leo Jorga, and to try to legitimize the regime. My, which means in a way to repeat the, Ira the American example in Iraq or in Afghanistan, which means that will lead for more wars to come. In the South, in the de-escalation zone in the South, we might see a new war between we have 30 to 35,000 FSA, Syrian Free Army. They used to be supported by the uh, MOC military operation center in the south of the CIA. And now they decided to drop, to stop the military support. So we have this 35,000 fighters without any support. And the Jordanians, they would like them to start fighting the Islamists or to try to make a deal with the regime. I think after some time, we will see that new war Nordism, new war wars between those guys and the Islamists, and regarding the South, maybe we will see war initiated by the Israelis. Because it seems that the Israelis are not very happy with the de-escalation zone in the South, because part of the deal was, which was struck 9th of July last year, is to push the non-Syrian fighters away from the borders, which means the Hezbollah and the Shiite militias. And it seems that the Israelis, until now, they're not very happy. Maybe we'll come back to this in the Q&A session. 
because I was in London and I heard a lot of talks about it. So it seems that the Israelis are very serious. If there is no, the Israelis, uh, if the regime and Iranians, Russians are not committed to it, maybe there will be escalation and new war in the south. In the suburb of Damascus, there might be new war between the Islamist, Jaish al-Islam, and al-Nusra, two Islamist factions, and maybe the regime will try to retake that part. In north, the de-escalation zone in the north, in Idlib, we will see, I think, two wars, or three wars, one between the Islamist, HTS, Hayi Tahrir al-Sham, al-Nusra, and the rest of the opposition figure, uh, group, uh, troops, or opposition factions, and maybe another war between the Islamists and the Kurds. This is, what the, this is what the Turks want. The Turks believe that they would like to push the PYD, the Kurds, there because they feel that the Kurds have this plan to establish corridor from Afrin, north of Aleppo, to the Mediterranean uh, Sea. The third war is, which I heard yesterday, the Ali Akbar, Kham, uh, Ali Akbar Wilayati, the advisor of the supreme leader of Iran, he said that we would like to retake Idlib and Raqqa, which means that they would like, at a certain point, to push the regime to Idlib. The other war that might erupt is in Raqqa. The Iranians said that we would like to retake Raqqa, and in addition to that, that's back to what I said about the Western war in Raqqa, Raqqa was retaken by the Kurds. The Raqqa was retaken by SDF, dominated by the Kurds which is a great thing, to destroy the capital of terrorist organization like ISIS. But I'm not sure that the people in Raqqa are very happy with that. Maybe they're happy for now, but I think after six months, after one year, they will revolt against the, uh, domina the Kurdish-dominated local council which is going to rule Raqqa. The fourth or fifth uh, war, or wars might happen in the regime-held areas because we always hear a lot of opposition areas and we don't talk much about it. Uh, we don't talk much about the regime-held uh, areas. There is, there, there are a lot of indications that there are tensions between the Shia militias, non-state actors supported by Iran and the regime forces. You can tell it, you can, we, we hear a lot of uh, indications about that. The priorities of the regime are different from the priorities from, of the Iranians and, uh, and uh, Russians. The other thing is that we see, at least I, I hear a lot of reports about, uh, I hear of a lot of reports that there are different interests between Russia and Iran as well in Syria. The Russians are supporting the, the regime army and the Iranians are supporting the militias. And in the regime held areas, we hear a lot of about, uh, reports about looting, warlords, corruptions, and efficiencies like that, that, that what, I mean, what uh, Hadi said, the institutions of the states are not functioning. That is the worst case scenario, and that is what I think is going to happen. I hope I'm wrong. The best case scenario is that this is a right of moment of truth. The emperor is naked, dash is over, Let's go back to Geneva. Let's go back to, to the political process. Let's resume Geneva process sponsored by the UN. Let's bring the opposition. I mean, I'm talking about the Russians and the Americans. Let's bring the opposition and the regime and push the opposition and the regime to try to find a way, settlement, to kick off a political process I hope there will be the transitional process, but I think that's, that is not very realistic now. To kick, if, to kick off political process, that will lead for sort of political uh, uh, reforms to meet the aspiration of the Syrian people and to combine two approaches, bottom up, bottom up approach and top down approach because now after seven years, uh, uh, the local authorities have, I mean, the local councils have more powers, the, the, the de-escalation zones, part of it to establish local councils. So to combine these, these two approaches, top, uh, top down and bottom up, and in addition to that, in parallel to this political process, to start sort of reconstruction process, 
We heard, I was in Brussels last, last month, and I, was, I attended some meetings. We heard, and we heard that to reconstruct Syria, you need 220 billion US dollars. So actually, to have parameters, like to link the political process with the reconstruction, that might be a good approach. And um, I hope this is what's going to happen. I hope this is what the foreign powers are going to work for. But I don't, I don't, I don't see that. So I will, I will vote. If I want to bet, I will bet to the first, uh, the first uh, option. And in the Middle East, we always learned, if you, wanna, if you have two predictions, you always take the, take the worst uh, prediction, because that, is my, that might, might, might be the, the truth in the future. So I'll stop here. So maybe we'll open it for the for discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ibrahim Amidi. Um, and, um, and I think I hear uh, one generally expressed view in, in the three presentations, which comes across very strongly, of course, uh, that the Syrians started a war maybe six and a half years ago, six years ago when it turned into a violent conflict, but it is not their war anymore, which also, of course, makes a possible resolution or the prospect of a resolution so much more complicated. Thank you also, um, uh, Mr. Hamidi, for bringing up a number of uh, topics, and I'm sure they will come back in the questions as well, regarding the prospects of resuming the UN-led Geneva process, um, local, local authorities, um, what could they mean in this process, and what are the prospects for, uh, for possible reconstruction? I, um, I, I would now like to open up the floor for discussion, and I think there will probably be many questions. I know there are also um, a lot of uh, Syrian persons here in the audience tonight, and I would uh, like to encourage them also, if they have a question or want to say something, to, to let us know. So if you, if you want to pose a question, please raise your hand. And I would also like to invite the people upstairs, if, if, if you want uh, to, um, to, to ask something, please come down and I'll, uh, I'll make sure you'll get the microphone. If you get the microphone, uh, please introduce yourself briefly and keep your question also as brief as possible so that um, we'll have as much people uh, possible uh, who can ask a question tonight. And we'll take three questions at a time, so please. Yes, I see a hand raised here, the gentleman here right in front of me. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Sherwan. I'm a humanitarian worker. I worked the last six years in the Syrian conflict in Syria, Turkey, neighboring country, also in the Bulgarian Turkish border. Uh, especially in 2015. What I want to ask, actually, there were three, the three presentations were amazing, actually. Each one presented uh, one aspect. But what I want to ask, actually, and it was, it was like a very interesting coincidence that I was reading the book of Mr. Vantam uh, recently, Destroying a Nation. I want just to ask why you say destroying, destroying a nation. Uh, and I want to ask Mr. Uh, Al-Bahra and also uh, Mr. Hamidi, uh, did the Syrian ever wear a nation? I mean, in the, since 1940, uh, 1940s, when the Syrian uh, Republic was established, after 60 years, uh, the Syrian could reach uh, like the, the, the status of being a nation, and why during the conflict, as soon as uh, the, the Syrian uh, government, let's say, uh, escalated the conflict, it led to uh, collapse of the Syrian community. Um, sorry for taking long. Thank you very much. That's okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I see um, someone in the far back raising his hand. Um. Um, hi, my name is Safran Malik Saitian. I'm not directly professionally linked to the conflict, just very interested. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Albari. Barra, sorry. Excuse um, me, could you speak up a little bit? Because sorry, it's a little hard maybe to hear. microphone close to my mouth. Yeah, um, I have a question for Mr. Uh, Mr. Al Bahra. Um, I think nobody disagrees with you for this noble vision of uh, of Syria's future. 
Uh, and understand from your position as a former head of the opposition that you have a certain view of the conflict. And now I'm not totally not uh, defending the Assad regime, but I'm just curious, what is your vision at the start of the Syrian uh, conflict when the opposition in certain, certain ways got hijacked by Islamists, for example, Nusra and ISIS? What is your vision on that? Thank you, thank you very much. We'll take one more question, and I see a gentleman right in the middle there, so I hope the phone can get to you. Uh, Hi, uh, my name is Peshmarga. Yeah. I'm from Syria. Uh, thank you all for this great uh, lecture, we'll call it. Um, my question to uh, uh, Van Dam. Thank you, Meneer Van Dam. Um, I left Syria back in 2012. I was a student. I, was, uh, I had demonstrated among with all students. I was beaten up by police. When I came to the Netherlands uh, in June, uh, end of June, uh, I was uh, settled in Tel Apple. I was going to Emmen. I saw a billboard on a station, uh, for a billboard with two pictures, one of Putin and one of Assad. And uh, uh, under it was stated in Dutch, I couldn't read Dutch. But it was a sign for me like, oh, the Dutch government is supporting Syrian people. Uh, my question is, uh, I live now five years in, in Holland, that, that support is really decreased. Besides the argument of we have to defeat IS, why see the Dutch government, actually that's my feeling, that's why I see, decrease the support to the Syrian people. Thank you, thank you very much. Well, I think we'll take uh, these uh, three questions and then I'll open up the floor for another round of questions. Um, and perhaps I would like to invite um, Mr. Albara first to respond to the questions that were asked to you. Um, mm -hmm. Was Syria ever a nation? Mm -hmm. And um, how do you feel about the Syrian opposition at the start of the conflict being hijacked by the mm -hmm. Islamists? As we all know, Syria uh, had a brief period of uh, national rule where after uh, revolting against the Ottoman Empire in uh, 1916 up to the 1920s. Uh, when we had in the 1919 the King Crane Commission in Syria, and I would like you to search on the internet for the King Crane Report and read what your fellow citizens in Syria thought about Syria and you judge yourself if they were a nation or not in 1919, not now. Second, during the French occupation of Syria in the 1930s, Syria were divided into three different countries. They established three different governments, three different flags, three different armies with all their efforts and they separated Syria in sectarian ways Druze, they have their republic and their uh, area, and the Alawi, they have their area, and the Sunni, they have their area. Unfortunately, to their surprise, it did not stand, and this whole thing failed apart. Why did it did fail? Because Syria was really divided to the limit where it cannot accept any more division, and Syrians, they were ready to pay the cost and the price to reunite their country, and as long as they are ready to play, pay this price, that means they see their nation as one nation, they see their country as one country, worse to pay their life for it. So yes, we are a nation. Mm -hmm. And, um, and the, the second question was about uh, the, the hijacking of the opposition by the uh, by Sure, the and this never happened by coincidence. This happened by design. The regime announced from the start, uh, start of the uprising uh, in the early 2011, and later on even till the 2012, they said their plan and they said it in video speeches, go on YouTube, research, and see the speech of the Grand Mufti of Syria, Sheikh Hassoun. How he threatened Europe and said, if you continue your support for this uprising, or if you carry any military operation against the Syrian regime, we have our terrorists even in your land who are ready to carry operation and blow up 
your cities. He said it on YouTube, go research it and see it. In early 2012, the regime released out of jail all the Islamists, the extreme Islamists, and left the civil movement people in jail with the prior knowledge that these guys immediately they will go and establish some armed movement. Unfortunately, even some countries, they felt that Islamists, they would have more incentive into fighting the regime than the national Syrians. So many of the aid and assistance went towards the Islamists. But we, as Syrians, we never supported Islamist movement against the regime only. What we supported is a national movement. We have a clear vision what we want. We want democratic Syria, multi-party system, civilized, civil ruling system, not military system. We care about citizenship, equal citizenship, equal rights, equal duties for all citizens. We want the return for freedom of every and each Syrian and the ruling party which will rule Syria according to our constitution and not according to their ideologies. This is in brief our idea. Thank you, thank you. Um, Ibrahim Amidi, uh, would you like to share some reflections yes, on a number uh, of yeah, these questions? Yeah. First of all, I think first of all, one, one of the biggest mistake, mistakes that the opposition Syrian opposition committed is to affiliate, affiliate itself with Al-Nusra. Al-Nusra is terrorist organization designated uh, according the U to the UN Security Council as terrorist organization, and it is. The opposition should have been very clear to distance itself from Al-Nusra as organization, A. B, but at the same time, we have to, when we look at Al-Nusra, we have to uh, see the reality. I am from Idlib. Al-Nusra is very strong in Idlib. And Al-Nusra is a terrorist organization. But not all the people in Idlib are terrorists, and not all the fighters in Idlib are part of Al-Nusra. Three, if we, really, if, we, if we really want to weaken Al-Nusra, we have to be fair. Just imagine yourself, you are in suburb of, of Aleppo, that there is a guy from Afghanistan or Pakistan, who doesn't know where, where he is. The Iranians paid him $300 per month or $500 to fight, a fight that it's, it's not his war, fighting people of Aleppo. Of course, the people in Aleppo, suburb of Aleppo and Idlib, they would go to Al Nusra to fight Al Nusra if Al Nusra is the only way to fight the Shia. So I think we have to be very fair when we look at, if you really want to fight terrorism and to dismantle Al Nusra as terrorist organization, which is she is, definitely it is. We have to be fair and look at the whole levels of the struggle. The second, uh, my response to my friend, my colleague, my, the gentleman here, I think we never had a nation state in the Middle East. I think, maybe I'm wrong. Your question is very fair. I think the whole concept of nation state was important to us in Levant. It was important by the Russians, by the French, we are addicted to the Russians now, by the, by the French and the, Brit, the Brits, Sykes-Picot, they came, I mean, they draw the map of our region. They thought that they'll bring this European concept of nation state and impose it on us. And then dictators, and I mean, for several reasons, it's not the time to discuss them. We failed after 100 years and one year, because it's the end of the anniversary was last year, we failed to establish state. And that is not just in Syria. In Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, in Libya, and the rest of the region, there is no, we are pre-nation state. The whole sub-identities are uh, arise when the whole state was shaken. So I hope, but at the same time, I agree with uh, Mr. Hadi, that should be the aspiration, to establish a nation state or to establish a state of citizenship. That should be the aspiration of the Syrians, which is not the case now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to invite uh, Coach Van Damme to reflect on a number of questions, in particular the title of, of your book, um, Why Destroying a Nation? Mm -hmm. And uh, secondly, there was a question from the gentleman here, and if I understood <coughs> it correctly, you asked 
Why does there seem to be less support from the Dutch government currently for the Syrian opposition than five years ago? Is, is, that, is that what you wanted to know? Decreased, decreased drastically, like in, back in 2012, like more in the media about Assad, Assad, yeah. Assad. Yeah. And now it's more like IS, Islamist, but besides that argument, besides the argument of uh, defeating yes. IS. Thank you, yes. Okay, Mark. thank you very much. Let me first start with the, my book title includes the word of nation. And uh, destroying a nation, it is not meaning that it's going to be destroyed, but it's being in the process of all kinds of forces to destroy the social fabric of Syria, of the country, so that is, I think, a correct title. But the concept of nation is a little bit vague. In English, it may be a little, have a different value than in the Netherlands. But for instance, you have in Dutch, so have a nation, you have the, the Islamic nation, al ummat al islamiya You have the Arab nation, al ummat al arabiya or al ummat al kurdiya or other nations. And then you have the concept of the nation state. In, actually, all these, uh, the Arab countries were colonized, uh, split up. Mm -hmm. So you have, in a way, unnatural, unnatural entities. But in the, after 100 years, the people within those entities, although they don't like the colonial boundaries, they wouldn't like either that something is taken off from their country. So con um, contradictory, perhaps, it sounds. But when there is a war, people are more, becoming more Syrian, perhaps, than they were before. Like in Lebanon, the Lebanese civil war, it was all within the framework of, um, of Lebanon. So there were a lot of controversies, of course, but they were Lebanese. So perhaps the Syrians have become even more uh, Syrian than they were. There is also the ideological concept of the Syrian nation, which was the concept of the Syrian Social Nationalist Party. They thought they had the ideology that the Syrian nation is the nation, the people of um, the Fertile Crescent, so Syria and Iraq and the bigger uh, and of, of Syria. So and Cyprus is part of it. I'm sorry? Cyprus is part oh, of it. Oh, Cyprus is part of it. So um, this about the nation. And in next year, there will be an Arabic edition of my book. And one of the problems is how you translate the uh, destroying a nation. Is it Tadmir Umma, which I think is a wrong translation, or Tadmir Shab Suri, or something like that? Well, we still have to make a decision on it. <laughs> Concerning the, uh, <coughs> what you have perceived as if the support of the Dutch government, actually I'm not part of it any longer, but still I have some ideas about it. And improve me, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, the, Syrian, the Dutch government supports the Syrian opposition. When I was a special envoy for Syria, I could go everywhere except to Syria itself because we were not supposed to have contacts with the Syrian regime. Um, we have all kinds of projects for the Syrian opposition. By the way, we organize also all kinds of, uh, of uh, um, training for negotiations and so on. We have non-lethal aid for this free Syrian army, a number of uh, Syrian groups, we have certain projects, educational projects, so we support Syrian students in Gaziantep or other places, um, even water projects, all kinds of projects. So, but they're not that visible, perhaps. So perhaps a little bit more, it will be known and uh, it is known, but perhaps it's not that visible in the media. So I think it's not at all the case that we are not any more interested in the Syrian opposition on the country. And, uh, but the situation is changing. Not that our policies are changing, but the surroundings are changing and perhaps therefore your perception is changing. But we are supporting the Syrian opposition and uh, not of course all opposition groups, but the Syrian Opposition Coalition, that's why the special Syria Special Envoy is located in Istanbul. Um, that's in short or long perhaps my answer. Thank you, thank you very much. And I would like to open up the floor for more questions. So once again, please raise your hands. If you have a question, then please come down from the balcony if you'd like to ask a question. I see a gentleman over there. 
Thank you. Hi. Um, I'm an undergraduate student of security studies at Leiden University. My name is Timothy Van der Venne. Uh, thank you for your inspiring and interesting speeches. Um, my question really goes out to all three of you gentlemen, and it has to do with the role of Iran in the region. I was wondering if uh, you can comment on whether or not you believe um, engaging in proxy relationships and war by proxy has become a permanent fixture of Iranian foreign policy in the region, and how you believe the, um, the role of Iran will change or develop in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please, in the front. Thanks. Um, I worked, Stefan van Wersch, I worked for three years in, in, for the Syrian people in, in Gaziantep. And uh, I must say that there uh, are many things I can uh, tell you which were not okay. But one of them was that actually the organizations the, um, here and, and so on, uh, could they you, could did you please keep uh, so sorry. Okay. They did fantastic work, but actually they didn't got any support. Uh, the money we got one year, there was money, and after that, all the donors were saying that it was not good enough, and and etc. And then for two years almost, there was no money at all, and I still don't understand how. The, um, the Syrians were able to continue, but they did. But that was a very painful situation, and I can tell you very many others that you say, if people, if organizations, if countries would have been willing to take a little bit more risk, um, things could have been better. Yeah, so, so, so your question is maybe why was that, that uh, especially for Syrian opposition groups who tried to be constructive and did very good work, the funds did not seem to be sufficiently forthcoming. Could you share those views or could you, could you elaborate on those? Thank you. And is, I saw, yes, one more hand there, yes. Thank Please. you very much. Masal khair, shukran kteer al... My question is, um, actually in Syria we have Syrians and we have other nationalities and other people. It's, it's a diverse actually society, but I was wondering about the refugees, the Palestinian refugees, the Iraqis. They were stuck in a sense because when all these, you know, fights have started, they were stuck and they were forced to choose sides. Some of them they left, they managed to, and they reached Europe, and I've spoken with many of them, but some are still there. So how do you see their situation at this moment and after when there's a kind of settlement, I would say? You mean the Iraqi, the Iraqi refugees? Iraqi, Palestinians, all. In Syria, right? Yes, thank you. So does your question, just for our clarification, does it also relate to Syrian refugees abroad or specifically? No, 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 no. I'm talking about foreign, foreign refugees. Well, I, don't, I wouldn't call them foreign, but mm -hmm. I mean, we are talking about the Palestinian refugees oh. from 1948, 67, yeah, I see. I and the Iraqis and others. I yes. mean, we have also, without Badun, who left Kuwait, and even they were yeah. somewhere in Syria. I think your question is clear. Thank you. I think we'll take one more question. I see a lot of hands now. Let me see. Uh, perhaps the gentleman there near the camera, if the microphone can get to him. <laughs> it's right in the middle. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Mohanad Abul Hassan. I used to work as a human rights violation documenter in Syria. And recently, I've just started working with Utrecht University on a research project about Syria. Uh, I have actually two questions, if I may. Uh, the first question is, um, sorry if I misunderstood anything, I heard a lot of scenarios about who's going to win the war. I haven't heard who's going to win the future. And the second scenario, um, for Mr. Bahra, uh, you came from Saudi Arabia, I think, and you've been living there for a while, and I would like to ask you if you have any comment about the latest changes in the Saudi Arabia regime or policies and how it's going to be reflected on the Middle East. Uh, in the near and long-term future. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. Perhaps um, we could first turn to, um, to Ibrahim Hamidi. Would you like to offer some reflections, for instance, on the question of the refugees that was uh, asked? 
Yeah, to the lady here. Uh, yeah, I think uh, it seems that you know the. Uh, it seems that you know the story very well. I think the. Um, um, I think most of the re or non-Syrians who live in Syria. Let, let let us call them this way. Non-Syrians who live in Syria. You have I Iraqis, Palestinians, Somalis. Uh, I think you said Kuwaitis. You different from different countries. My perception. I mean, the way I see it, at most of them, being divided. The same way the Syrian people were divided. I think the Iraqi refugees, if I'm not wrong, because of most of them, or many of them are Shiite, and they used to live as in the Saudi Zainab, they were part of the whole Iranian intervention in Syria. And you had the other Iraqi who were Sunnis, who, I mean, they were, some of them were involved in, with ISIS, with uh, you know some Islamic factions in eastern part of Syria, and the same with Palestinians. I think some Palestinians, as you know, in the Mukhayyam al Yarmouk, they were divided. Some Palestinians were fighting with the regime, like Jabhat Shabil Qiyad Al Ahmad Jabril, and some Palestinians were fighting with the opposition, like uh, uh, Aknaf al Maqdis. I think they were very close to Hamas, and as you know, many Palestinians already left. I think hundred. 10, 120,000 Palestinians left Syria to some of them to Europe, right? Out of 400? Hmm? 145. So out of 400 or 500, right? There were 500. For, so one third already left. So I think what happened to most of non Syrians who used to live in Syria is the same with, with what happened with the Syrians, I think. This Thank is my perception. Yes. Thank you. And uh, would, would you like to also answer, perhaps, if we take those questions together, the role of Iran in the region is war by proxy a permanent fixture. Uh, the role of Saudi Arabia, would you like to reflect on that or shall I uh, move on to perhaps uh, Mr. Hadi? Would you like to answer that question? Yeah. I will, I will, I will yeah. say, I will be very brief. I will leave yes. uh, Saudi Arabia to Mr. Hadi al Bahra because he lived there. Uh, um, uh, very brief, I think, yes, Iran, the Iranian role is now, I think, at high stake. I mean, it's Part of part of the discussion, uh, I, th I think there there is some talk that if you want to reduce the Iranian influence in the region, one of the playing ground is Syria, and to control the eastern part of Syria, and to help the Kurds maybe and the Americans to help some tribal leaders and Kurds leaders to, uh, to control the eastern part of Syria and the, break the crescent from Tehran, Baghdad to Damascus. This is, this is I think it's, there's a lot of talk about this. Second is that some Gulf states, some Arab countries bet, they are betting that if we cooperate with the Russians, the Russians might reduce the Iranians, the Iranian role in Syria. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah, no. Yes, can I add something about Iran? In the first place, thanks to the Americans, the Iranians are influential everywhere now because they toppled the regime of Saddam Hussein and he was taking care of keeping the Iranians off. But the Iranians are given opportunities uh, by, let's say, uh, vacuum in all kinds of places. They take the opportunity. If they can advance, they will do so. I remember in the 80s, or the, we were all the time talking about the, that the Iranians wanted to export the revolution, and they denied it. But if they are getting the opportunity, like for instance now also in Yemen, uh, the Saudi intervention in Yemen, another disastrous military intervention, this uh, gives the Iranians the opportunity to um, to support the Houthis, so to how to um, to bring back that influence will be extremely difficult. And you have also that the Israelis want, in fact, to deal with the Iranian nuclear power, whatever it is. And now they get the Saudi Arabian Saudis on their side. And uh, I once spoke to one of the Saudi ministers or princes. He said, "We have this anti-Iranian feeling in our DNA." So um, they get the opportunity in Lebanon. Uh, it's very difficult to, uh, it's all the result, not most of it, is the result of military interventions. 
That's why my thesis is, and thus far it has not been contradicted, that almost any military intervention leads to another disaster. Can I also answer the, some sure. other points? Yeah, then yeah. we'll move on. So I think concerning uh, Stefan van Vers, what you said about uh, the lack of aid to the Syrian interim government, it was, well, first place, I think Qatar was of the main donors, but also others. But the point was for various donors, the, a kind of vicious circle. They wanted to support the Syrian opposition, but if they would uh, channel funds through the Syrian opposition, a coalition or the Syrian interim government, they didn't trust that enough, so they preferred to fund directly. And well, thereby the vicious circle was uh, maintained. Um, concerning shortly the refugees, the Syrians, they accepted, they uh, not invited, but they, they accepted millions of Iraqi refugees when the war was going on there after the uh, occupation of Iraq by Britain and uh, the United States. And they had many Palestinians. They were living under a special condition. But um, I think when they, these communities or parts of these communities were perceived as taking sides in the conflict inside Syria, they were bearing the brunt, whether justified or not. Um, yes. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I will start where he finished. Many people, they don't know that Syria in the 1916 through the 1920 was one of the main country hosting refugees from Greece, Turkey, and other parts of the world. They opened their door welcoming uh, people from Greece, from Armenia, from Turkey, and they hosted them in Aleppo and Damascus. Syria always hospitable to all refugees and to their fellow human uh, kind. And mainly also during the Lebanese civil war, we hosted all Lebanese. During the Iraqi wars, we hosted the Iraqi refugees in Syria. And this is, we are proud of, you, of it, as you should be proud yourself of offering and being your country hospitable to the Syrian refugees which we really thank you from the bottom of our heart for this effort and for your welcoming the Syrian refugees. In return, we promise you that these are productive people, genius people. They will contribute to your cities, to your communities, and hopefully they will become uh, proud citizens of uh, Holland themselves. Uh, my answer on the other question regarding the Iraqis and whatever majority of these refugees, either they left Syria or some of them they are fighting with the Syrian government, few of them they are staying, trying to stay on the side. The Palestinian refugees, they took sides. Some of them, they fought with the Syrian people. Some of them, they ended in jail, being tortured in jail. And some of them, they fought with the government. And as you know, Palestinians and Syrians, you can't differentiate between them. In our history, we are one. Uh, what the other question, if you remember? There, were, um, so, there yeah. was a question on the role of Iran that has been yeah, answered Iran. already. Iran the... is a major problem in the region, not a new. Iran is a state which with double personality. From one side, they want to, Iran wants the, its neighbors and the international community to deal with it as a state in regular political and diplomatic relationship. But in the same time, Iran infiltrate each and every country in the Middle East, make relationship with political parties directly and with local militias, feed them with arms with money to revolt against their own government. Big part of it is not about really Shiism and Sunni. It's more about a nation which they think it's their turn to dominate the Middle East and to call on the policies and the politics in that region. A dream which they have, but this goes against the dreams of all their neighbors. So if you look on each and every conflict, now in the Middle East, you find the Iranian 
fingers and it stuck. Lebanon, imagine a state, a full state, which is run from behind by one of the political parties who has its own militia, its own army, which is stronger than the nation army. So now Lebanon, in actuality, is hijacked country by this political party. Would you permit in Holland one political party to establish a militia, becomes stronger than your own national army, and dictate your policies and how the future of Holland could be? Same thing now they are trying to duplicate in Syria. They started, they brought these foreign militias and they misguided them. They brought young guys from Pakistan, from Afghanistan, telling them that the Syrians against Shia. The Syrians, they want to kill each and every Shia. They want to burn the shrines of Shias, which is the biggest lie. The shrines of Shia, they've been in Syria thousands of years ago. Some of them hundreds of years. How they stayed in Syria if we hate Shia? We are a society open for everyone, for all ideas. We never been enemies for any ideology or whatever, as long as they stay peaceful and act peacefully. So the main core problem in, in the Middle East, really you cannot establish uh, peace and stability in the Middle East unless the Iranian regime held its power in its own country and start to act as neighborly country and spend their money instead on war, spend it on the development of their own nation and maybe on some intelligent joint projects for the whole Middle East so we can really elevate the uh, people of the Middle East and let them enjoy and be productive in the life. Thank you. And there was also a question, I believe, on Saudi Arabia and the recent developments Saudi Arabia. in Saudi, Saudi Arabia, how that would possibly affect the situation. The events in, what's happening in Saudi Arabia is normal. It's normal evolvement of the regime itself, or the ruling party. As we know, Saudi Arabia has been ruled by generations of elder uh, rulers within the ruling family in Saudi Arabia. Suddenly, these elder people, they took a wise decision that the challenges of that Saudi Arabia facing in the future needs that the new young generation given a chance to lead Saudi Arabia itself. One of the princes, who is the crown, current crown prince, Prince Mohammed bin Salman, was one of the leading, or the son of the king, who had a vision of how Saudi Arabia could move forward, which they call the vision of 2030, which lays down a real clear plan where Saudi Arabia should be by 2030. And big part of it is positive program, including privatizing some state-run uh, companies, being more transparent, announce their budget, their, open their books for auditing, for the people to know, and really create more job opportunities for Saudis themselves. But this also, there are real challenges facing Saudi Arabia to go these, uh, through these changes and in the same time facing the threat of the Iranian in Yemen, for example, which is a neighbor country for Saudi Arabia and create a real threat to, the, uh, to Saudi Arabia. On another front, they are trying to assist in resolving the Syrian crisis because they see the Iranian also threat coming from that direction. Gary, can Thank I say you. a few, few words? Uh, yes, fine, of course. Not. No, 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 you, no, you absolutely can. But I wanted also to open the floor for one more round of questions. So would you like to do that now or uh, yes. in relation to this specific yes, issue? Yeah, yeah, okay. I think, Iran, is, I think Iran's, uh, Iran issue is a very important issue, very okay. important. Yeah. Uh, just again to what uh, uh, responded to the, what the gentleman asked. You know, since Trump announced his Iran strategy, just because I think there's a big gap between what's been announced in Washington and what is happening with the reality. Since he announced the strategy to weaken Iran, I think two weeks ago, the Iranians changed the whole balance of power in Kurdistan, and they pushed Barazani out, and they brought, in a way, the PUK people to be more stronger. Iran recontrolled, Iran and its militias, recontrolled their Zor and yesterday Al-Bokamal, 
this eastern <coughs> part of Syria, and Iran fired missiles on, uh, on Riyadh. So you feel that the Iranians now are on, on, on the offensive on the ground to counterbalance uh, Trump's strategy to weaken Iran. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. So let's take one more round of questions. We have a little bit of time, and I see a number of hands. There's a lady here in the front who's been asking for the floor. There are people in the back, but first, Can lady in front, the, please. We have yeah. two people in the back. Yeah, yeah, they'll get the microphone, but first, the lady here, and then we'll, I'll move to the back. Yeah. My, name is, my name is Samar Shalan, and I'm uh, from Lebanon. I'm living here almost 25 years. How many years? 25. My question. Um, what I'm, I'm not good in politics, but what I understand today uh, from Mr. Van Dam that uh, all the countries are involved in uh, Lebanon. Uh, my feeling from Yuli both that uh, Iran is the problem uh, from Syria. My question is. Uh, who was involved in the beginning, ISIS, Nasra of Iran. My second question is, uh, who planted the hate uh, between Sh uh, Shia and Sunnah and to uh, people fight each other? Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll take two more questions and please keep it brief. There is a gentleman all the way in the back there. He's been standing there for a while. So you'll get the microphone finally, yes. <laughs> But please keep your question short so we have some time for the answers. I'll try. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, my name is Khaled Al-Kurdi. I'm the manager of the Syrian Cultural and Community Center here in the Netherlands. I want to thank you all here for hosting this nice event. Uh, my question, actually, during Mr. Fandam speech, he was talking about the accountability. And it's a kind of process is going to be after the political transaction. But how we are going to activate the accountability after the political transaction while you are going to give people who are involved in murder a legitimate authority in the new role in Syria? Wouldn't it be more rational to, to start to activate the accountability first than to do the political transaction? That's first. And my second question is, is there in the near future going to be a new Geneva discussion or debate, especially after the regime now is going stronger and stronger? Is there going to be any way to be on the table again and talk about and activate the decision come from Geneva or not? Especially the first Geneva has done, first one. Thank you. Thank you. One more question. Let me see. I Can see a lot of hands some, raised. Um, let's take, uh, take some Dutch people. Yes. Well, well one moment. Uh, I think we'll move over there. Yes, please. Yeah. Thank you. Hello. My name is Nienke Weijreich, former diplomat and currently responsible for the uh, uh, refugee uh, policy of the city of Haarlem, close to Amsterdam. Um, Mr. Al Bahra, I have a question for you. I was wondering, of course. Uh, you were talking about the refugees here in the Netherlands and the question of representation of the opposition has been, well, a long t longer term one. And um, since the influx of refugees into Western Europe, I'm wondering to what extent do you have the, or does the um, opposition have the ambition to uh, represent also the refugees uh, in Western Europe, whose thoughts seem to be evolving. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we have three questions here. Um, uh, the first one from the lady in the front. Um, uh, who planted uh, the hatred between the Sunni and the Shia? Um, the question on accountability, which was addressed specifically to you, I believe, uh, goes. And then a um, question on the future of the Geneva negotiations. Do they have any chance of succeeding? And does the opposition also represent refugees? So whom of you would like to reflect? Should first? I start with the uh, Sunni Shia? Yes, please. Yes. So, um, well, no, let me start, first start by the accountability. If you want to make the regime accountable, then you must catch them. 
I mean, you cannot have uh, accountability of the president or the people around him, but you cannot put them in prison. So if you cannot defeat them militarily, it's impossible to say, well, we first have uh, accountability. It's simply impossible. So that is supposed to be part of the deal. And it could well be that if you have a deal, if there was, it's going to be a deal at all with the regime, that some people are uh, being allowed to leave without punishment. It can be part of the deal. If that will be an end of the uh, war, it could be a possibility, like in South Africa, although the situations are not at all comparable. But before a political deal, it's impossible, except if you defeat the regime, but it's not uh, the case. Concerning the Sunni Shia, I think much of it is the perception. It is a lot of people in, I'm sorry to say so, but many journalists have also, uh, people start, it's a, in a way it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, uh, prophecy. The more you talk about it, the more it becomes true, because it's not whether well, it's objectively, if that exists, it, true, but it is the perception of people. So for instance, Iran, um, Iraq used to be, I mean, in the war in 1980, 88, was supposed to be also having the dimension of Sunni Shia, but it was not at all the case. Most of the uh, Shia people of Iraq were loyal to the regime, or at least not disloyal to the regime. They could have been disloyal in the military and so on. And if you look at, often it's being said that the alliance between the Tehran and Damascus is sectarian, but it's nonsense because the, uh, the Iran, the, may be a theocratic regime, but the Syrian regime is not at all a the theocratic regime. But um, it is not an element, if you talk about sectarianism, which is equal on both sides, on all sides. So it may be that in, let's say in Syria, not generally speaking, but some Sunnis may be seeing it as something religious when they when they fight the um, when we fight the regime, particularly the extremists like the the uh, in the past also the extremist uh, offshoots of the Muslim Brotherhood that called the Tala al Tala al Muqatala, the who killed Alawis because they were Alawis, hoping that they would create a polarization between the Alawis and Sunnis. It was not a well. Uh, overthought thought project. So I think um, when it is about Saudi Arabia and Iran, of course, the Saudi or the Gulf ministers uh, talk, they say there is not one Sunni minister in the cabinet in, in Iran, but I think the national or so called national dimension is much more important. Uh, Iran, well, Farsi or Persian, many will deny it, but it is more about nationality or um, the wish to have a great nation, to, to use that fake, the nation of Iran, which is then the main, the uh, uh, Persian or Farsi, and the Saudis, which is mainly Sunni. But so there's a lot to be said about Sunni Shia, but I think, personally, I think it's very uh, exaggerated, although it is there. But the more you talk about it, the more it is going to be a reality. Um, yes. But then you said also something, what was there first? IS, Daesh, or Nusra? Yeah. It's very... Mm. Oh, I think it was not... Like to... Sorry? Yes. We'll move on naturally, organically, yeah. we'll go to you. Perhaps you'd also like to take the question. Who started this? I remind you, during the civil war and the war of 2006, Syrian Sunnis, they hosted Shia families in their homes. We opened our doors, our homes, my own house, I, one of them was, to host all of them. We loved each other. We never felt they are our enemy, and until today we don't feel they are our, they are our brothers, sisters. We care about them. But few of them, yes, the extremists of them and the extremists of the Sunni, they are the one igniting. But who is helping them to ignite it, the Iranian regime, Hezbollah leadership, and the Syrian regime. Why? Because at the start of the Syrian revolution, there were a serious discussion within the regime. And they came out that no Alawi or Shia is ready 
to really sacrifice his life fighting for Assad. But if they let each Alawi and Shia think that he's fighting for his own survival, then they will stand by Assad. Based on this, they started on the sectarian issue, try to inflame it and try to convince not the Sunni first, but to convince first the Shia and the Alawis that it is a war against you. These people, they want to slaughter you. They want to kill you. Even we know for a fact the first videos who, which igniting the sectorism issue in Syria were leaked by the Syrian intelligence themselves. And this is a proven case. So these are the people who really inflamed the situation, not the people or who came first, Nusra or whatever. In my opinion, with many proofs, Nusra was a creation of Assad regime. And they are the one who opened the door and made it easy for them to grow. And we have many evidence in this direction. So Would this is the question of the first answer. Yes. Yeah. Second answer for our... Sure, we are responsible for each and every Syrian uh, refugee outside. But to be honest with you, I met with the Syrian, uh, many Syrians since I came here a few days ago. I met them today also, and I will meet them tomorrow. I feel you are doing a great job with the refugees, and uh, you are doing, and also they are doing a great job trying to be responsible in this country. The big challenge for Syria in the future, how many of these refugees are, will be willing to come back to Syria? Because all past conflict, I know they failed in returning these refugees. Like in the Bosnia, only 10% of the refugees came back to Syria. So yes, we want to keep the relationship strong. We want them to become very good citizens for, in Holland but willing either to come back to Syria or contribute and volunteer for some work in, this, in Syria in the future. Thank and you very what much. What is the third quote? Um, well, there was, there was a question, but I was wondering maybe uh, Ibrahim Amidi would also like to answer. Mm -hmm. It's about the Geneva, the, 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 the prospects of the uh, Geneva negotiations. And, um, but can I say uh, uh, just a few, few words on the... On a question from the lady here. Yeah. Uh, to be, I think to be objective, maybe I'll disagree a little bit with uh, my friend Hadi. To be objective, uh, I think the allies of the regime and the allies of the opposition, both of them, worked very hard. And the second, uh, I mean, 2012, I think, end of 2011, 2012, to, I mean, both of them, the allies of the regime, the allies of the opposition, both of them, to militarize, Islamicize, and sectarianize the Syrian revolution. Both of them are equally responsible. Both of them. Now, regarding, regarding Geneva, um, I agree with uh, my friend uh, Kos that yes, I mean, the regime will never ever negotiate. Will never ever give any concession. Uh, uh, in, in, I mean, the regime, when the regime is losing, they feel that, okay, we don't negotiate under pressure. When they are winning, they feel, okay, there is no need for negotiations. The only hope, I think, the only hope is that the Russians, if the Russians believe that, okay, for, the, for their own interests, they would like to make a deal, maybe they can make Geneva succeed. Uh, Geneva talks succeeds. One good example is that Astana process. I was told by you, a very high level UN guy that neither the regime nor the opposition knew anything about Astana negotiations. Both of them were there in Geneva uh, and Astana process and the Russians were negotiating with the Iranians and with the Turks and the, and the Americans on, in Jordan and they imposed the deals on the Syrian players. So if the, American, the Russians agree with the Americans on certain deal, yes, I think Geneva might work. So in that regard, it's very important that to keep this wheel running, to keep Geneva process alive. And that's why, that's why Stefan de Mastura has invited to next round of negotiations on 28th of this month in Geneva. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think on that note, we, we've, we've come to the end of this discussion. I know there were many more questions, and I saw many more hands raised. But as usual, we would like to invite all of you to have a drink with us afterwards and um, continue the discussion if you would like to. Um, I would like to conclude by quoting one of uh, Syria's most important intellectuals, Yassin al hash Saleh. In his recent book, uh, The Impossible Revolution, Making sense of the Syrian tragedy, he writes, the crisis is no longer a Syrian one. It is a crisis of the world. And facing this crisis, according to Saleh, requires new principles and new institutions, starting with the principle of global responsibility, of our own responsibility to the world and of the world's responsibility for us. No one is too distant to be a neighbor. No one is too alien not to belong to us. On that beautiful note, I think, I would like to conclude this evening. And I would like to thank everyone who has made this evening possible, in particular my, uh, my assistant, Jaap van Ark. And of course, I would like to thank our distinguished speakers. It's been a privilege to have you here. We are very grateful for the expertise and insights you shared, and we admire your resilience and courage. And I hope that many of us will not feel too distant to be your neighbor. Thank you very much. Thank you.